Uh, today's Saturday, January the 10th. We're in, is it Decatur or Atlanta? Decatur. Decatur, Georgia, talking with Craig Cook. Craig who made Iverson Cook. Craig, Craig Iverson Cook. And um, we're here doing an interview for the Gay Spirit Visions Oral History Project for Georgia State University. So Craig, we're going to ask a series of questions. Take your time. Don't worry about uh, pausing before answering if you want to. And ask us if we. No, I'm going to be worried about that. that. And ask us if you want us to want uh, me to repeat the question. And the questions are just probes, so we're just going to ask these, hoping that, that you'll eventually cover everything by the time we ask them all. So. Um, I was kind of approach it like a conversation. Yeah, good. Okay, the first one is more ID information than anything else. <clears throat> I want you to describe your family background by telling where you were born, where your parents and grandparents were from, when you were born, about your siblings, if you have any siblings, um, you know, what gender they are. That, how many you have. And then tell us about one or two uh, profound childhood experiences that you had mm -hmm. that you think have influenced you heavily. Mm -hmm. And then your partnership history. So I'll go back through those one at a time so you can answer one at a time. First of all, your family background. Where were you born and where were your parents and grandparents born and where were you raised? Okay. Uh, I'm Craig Iverson Cook. I was born in uh, the middle of a soybean field in this little tiny town in Ohio. Uh, industrial town. We had the world's largest union carbide plant in this little tiny town. There was lots of jobs. It was dirty and it was flat and it was Catholic. I was uh, grew up in a little parish, a French German parish, which that area was settled by the French and the Germans, typically. Um, and the name of the town? Fostoria, Ohio, mm -hmm. just south of Toledo. We were very impacted by the auto industry and that whatever happened to them mm -hmm. or didn't. Uh, let's see. My mother, Jenny Bell Reisner, was, uh, had 12 brothers and sisters. They, uh, when mom died, I realized that pretty much that entire family lived within 20 miles of their entire lives because the cemetery where she was uh, buried was just down the road. Um, so I don't know what that has to do with anything, but um, they, they were onion farmers right there in that part of Ohio. There's, uh, the, the earth there is called muck. It was a swamp a million years ago, and it grows onions. So that's what uh, what she did as a, as a uh, in her childhood growing up. Um, they were Pentecostal, and uh, so she come from a, also a very fundamentalist background as well. And um, her parents, my grandfather Lee Reisner and my grandmother. Nine of Reisner were from Kentucky, and they were they were uh, they are they were uh, Irish, English, and Welsh background. And um, when they my great great grandparents all that when they came to the United States and all that I don't know anything about that, sadly. Your parents were not Catholics, but my they father, were in a Catholic area. Oh, okay. Yes. My, when my mother met my father, she converted to Catholicism. Okay. Yeah. And, and so my father was from right there. He had uh, two sisters and a brother. They were German. My grandmother, Isabel Lickley, was French. And my uh, grandfather, Clem Cook, was German. Um, the Cook, his, his, his great-grandfather, and three brothers uh, ran away from the Kaiser in Germany and they went to England and changed their name from KLCH to COOK so they couldn't be tracked or, or uh, yeah. 
and then came to the United States. And on the boat, they met the Li the Lickleys. And three of the brothers married three of the Lickley women. And that somehow they ended up in Foss Story. I don't know about that part. When were you born? I was born in 1951. Mm -hmm. April 20th. And any siblings? I have four sisters, younger sisters. Okay. Um, how about profound childhood experiences that you know have been profound for a while? <laughs> Good ones or bad ones? <laughs> Either. Oh, wow, there's, there's a, quite a few. Um, when I made my first Holy Communion in the second grade, there's such a hype about all of that. Um, I'm up on the sanctuary, up in the sanctuary, which you didn't do. The bishop, you know, puts the host on my tongue and nothing happened. There was no bright light, no warm fuzzy, no, no, nothing. And I was um, really, really upset about that. I made up a lot of stuff about that. And I, yeah. And uh, in the sixth grade, my father, um, who was physically abusive, um, threw me on the floor and tried to strangle me. Mm made up a lot of stuff about that. So those are two not so positive, I guess, but okay. impactful. Okay, the history of your partnerships, your significant other relationships. Oh, okay. <laughs> In sequence, if possible, but maybe not. Well, I'm going to go back to the first one, I guess. When I was in the second grade, I won the diet the, the art contest for the diocese and everybody finished their pictures in the gym before they were sent off to, to be judged or whatever. And the, the boy next to me, his name was Dan Gunlock, was in the fourth grade and I fell in love with him that day. I didn't know what that was, but I stalked him. I rode my bike by his house all the time and, you know, I just kind of lived to see him again or, or, or be able to, and then he disappeared and one thing led to, and, and we ended up in high school together. And I moved in with him in 1969 in West Virginia and uh, where I, my first go at college also, the relationship was a disaster. <laughs> As was my uh, two quarters at West Virginia University. So then in Let's see, 71 I met John, and it was a torrid romance, and it, it did not go well at all, and that, that, was, it, that was not good. Then, uh, let's see, in 80 I met Craig Weiss. We were together 14 years. Um, it was a good relationship at the end. You know, we've grown apart. Sorry. Right. I didn't realize she was even That's there. Okay, she um, used to be in there. <laughs> Who am I saying I'm sorry to? Um, so, and then eight years ago, I met Sean Iverson. Uh, we were together. Sean passed in um, May of 2013. We were together seven and a half years, I guess. Okay, can you describe your coming out experience? Sure. Anything before the fourth grade? <laughs> <laughs> the fourth grade? Isn't that what you said? You met this artist? Oh, well, yes. That was, I was in the second grade, of course, mm -hmm. but there was no... So, um, there was no quiz. Pre-puberty. Okay. Um, yeah, I came out uh, in April of my senior year. Uh, a boy kissed me. College or high school? High school. High school. Okay. And uh, it was that simple. Uh, I just I was out. I told everybody, and not everybody, but I, I pretty much flew out of the closet. Mm -hmm. It was pretty pretty uh, painless, really. Uh, my parents were great. My family was great. Your dad was great? Well, my, no, I, you, I'm glad, not great, but 
certainly considerate. There was no, he had mellowed a great deal, I think, at that point. And I think what actually my father had sort of made up, it's right after the incident in the floor, to hands mm -hmm. off or something like that. I got to stay, I got to keep this under control. So it was like that. Our relationship didn't get better, that's for sure. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay. Tell us about any relatives, acquaintances, friends, mentors, events, or experiences that shaped your spiritual journey before attending your first GSB conference. So anything prior to that, kind of how that developed for you as a spiritual journey. Okay. Um, well, growing up Catholic, I grew up with a lot of ritual, um, you know, a little bit of pomp, a little bit of uh, piety, and, you know, all that, because I, it was still, it was be a lot of growing up was before the ecumenical council, so it was still the old kind of Roman Catholic traditions. And um, and then uh, in 1969, I graduated and from from um, oh from high school. Okay. And, and uh, started to figure try to figure out college and my rest of my life and became I was pretty much a full blown hippie, so I sort of I guess had that sort of earth sensibility without really knowing it yet, and. Um, really spent a lot of time looking at spirituality, my spirit, my way of expressing it or or getting it by going to different churches. I was involved with unity for a while in metaphysics, um, Atlanta Church of Religious Science. Uh, I did a lot of uh, some work around in the, in the whole Eastern um, considered being becoming a Buddhist and but it, but I really ended up being a guppy when I met Craig Weiss. Like you know, I had new, we had new cars and we had a house and we we had really corporate jobs and you know we were we were uh, living the gay leave it to Beaver June Cleaver kind of lifestyle I guess, and there was no spirituality there. Um, and then I went to my first. We were, Craig and I were um, separated, still lived together, and I, at the urging of Franklin Abbott, who I was uh, seeing, who he was, uh, he was counseling me in the, my breakup with Craig Weiss, handed me a flyer and said, I think it's time you consider this. And that's how I got to GSV and found a real expression of spirituality that worked for me. Okay. Do you know or what what was going on in your life that made you receptive to that invitation to attend GSB? The breakup or something else? I mean, do you know why you were receptive to Franklin's suggestion? Yes, I do know. Okay. Um, I didn't even know till well after the conference, but I had um, pushed all that hippie, fairy, earth kind of um, expression, I guess, over in the corner because I just didn't see how any of that could work in, in my made up vision of what it was to be a Craig Gay happy man. Mm -hmm. The beaver, beaver cleaver sort of story didn't work with with the alternative, with all that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I really wanted that. I didn't know it. And and uh, is that the answer to the question? So when I went to the conference, that all just just blew. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it was like it erupted. It came out again, sort of. Do you recall what most appealed to you about? about your first conference, what the best thing about it was, was yeah. it reclaiming that, 
all that stuff you put away, or was it some, some feature that happened there that really impressed you the most? If if I had if I narrowed it down to one aspect, it would I would say the beauty of it, the beauty of who we were being there at the mountain was that had an authenticity and a I don't know real a primal kind of realness that I had never even seen or. I had no idea gay men could even be like that, and and it, in an instant it was like that's me. Just to go back to one of the earlier questions, um, were there any particular people or relatives who really influenced your spiritual journey that you can think of now, uh, or experiences before GSV that were? super important to your spiritual development? Like an aunt or a grandmother or a whatever? Mm -hmm. Or not? Not really. Okay. Okay. Pretty much, we were pretty middle class America, mainstream kind of. Mm -hmm. yeah. And no teachers or anything that you feel like were kind of looking back on it, guides or beacons or for the spirituality now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so when did you attend your first conference? Was it the first conference? It was the third conference. Third conference. Uh -huh. Do you remember what year that was? 93, I okay. think. Right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, That's yeah, right. Uh, Spanbauer, Tom Spanbauer. Okay. Okay, so um, just briefly describe your life circumstances at the time of that first conference. You, you, were you living in a city or or not? Were you <coughs> out of that relationship? And for how long? Anything else that was kind of surrounding your decision to go to the conference? Um, well, certainly Franklin was a uh, major influence at me going because I um, trusted him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had it that he had my best interest at heart. And, um, Were you and, living by yourself at that point? No, I was, no. I was, Craig, Craig and I were still in some conversation about we can work this out. We, like, we can still live together and be single and date. And that, <laughs> that didn't work. But, so, no, I was in the world of working it out, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I knew this didn't work, so I'm trying this mm -hmm. kind of. And were you in a, in a job at that time that you had been in for a while, or were you between? No, I was. Um, I was with small. I was in uh, an architectural firm that I'd been in for ten years. Okay. okay. At that point. So, what do you remember about that first conference? What specific flashes do you have from then? Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> if you can isolate the first yeah. conference. Oh yeah, I ones. definitely can, yeah. Well, I was, dry, I drove up there alone. I didn't really know anybody at all except for one person, Dale Moore, who was a, an, a, a long time friend who had fallen in love with it in the very beginning. And I made up that it was just really weird and uh, kind of resisted. And so I'm driving up there and very, uh, confronted by what I made up was going to happen, like what was I going to have to do and say, and were we going to be naked, and, and did I have the right clothes, and you know, I had no idea what I was going into, and I was afraid, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what my first memory of getting there was the altar in the treehouse. And in though that year, it, everybody brought their gifts, their small group gifts, and just put them on the altar. So that was the altar, was the small group gifts. And I had forgotten my small group gift. And all I had was this cheap uh, polyester Hawaiian lei hanging, over, hanging on my rearview mirror. 
So I was immediately like, oh my god, I've already screwed this whole thing up. <laughs> and I don't have the right gift. Uh, so that was my gift. Um, don't let me forget, I'll get back to that. Um, and so I, I was immediately taken by the diversity that was there. I was immediately uh, taken, I immediately got that I was not like over here different from everybody. I was part of, it, it made sense that I was there and I could see there were guys I could relate to there and it, it wasn't this very alien sort of uh, group. Uh, even though at Heart Circle I, I was like, oh my god, I have no idea what to say and I'm going to say the wrong thing and, you know, all that. Um, <clears throat> the next really big thing that I remember clearly, uh, well, I was taken with Tom, Tom Spanbauer and I loved um, what he had to say. The talent show, I'd never seen anything like it. It was magic. And I didn't believe in magic, but it was. Um, and there again, what, well, I was really starting to um, be really, uh, I don't know what the word is, impacted by who everybody was being. They were, it, was, it was so real. That made me those. Okay. And, you know, and I'd seen gay men dress up and do drag and all that, and this was not that. It was, it was a lot more authentic than that. <clears throat> not that it was full of that. It was, there was just the fairy dress-up stuff was there that I'd never really seen before. And, um, and just guys that, that had courage would get up and, and tell a poem that they'd written or do something they'd never done before in front of their peer in front of all these I was impressed by that because I had not did not have that nerve <clears throat> well and then by Saturday night at the fire um, there was a uh, man there named Peter Bearwalks and he was as I understand it um, sort of a consultant that year and he brought a lot of Native American drums and there were probably six or eight fairies from Short Mountain there. Um, and it, it, and all there was was the fire. Now there's the fire and there's, there's massage, there's all kinds of other things. And the, and the fire is, gets watered down this year. Everybody came to the fire, the whole conference. And it was a beautiful crystal clear night, the stars. and. I lost it. Hmm. I hung on to a tree pretty much the whole evening. Just watching. I was um, just so moved. Touched. And um, by the beauty of it. And the love that was there, and the uh, acceptance, and just everything—it was—it was beautiful. And possibly that conference may have been the first time in my life I was ever really present, or present to being present, or present to to what it's like to be present. You know, I actually had, was conscious of that. It's like, this, you know, I, I, that whole conversation I always thought was kind of a silly one. Um, yeah, and I couldn't talk about the conference for two weeks <laughs> afterwards. People say, oh, that thing you went to on that weekend? I go, yeah, how was it? Well, it was, I e <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> it was wonderful. Tell us about some of the, the rituals or traditions or behavior that you encountered there that you had not ever seen before. Um, well, Heart Circle, for sure, with the talking stick. Uh, I knew what that was, but, uh, but, the, but gay men would do that, or it was, that was a brand new thing for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the Wiccan stuff, 
Um, I'm not sure there was a lot of that at the conference uh, exactly, um, but there was a workshop about it that I um, was afraid to go to because I, I just made up stuff about that. Um, certainly, I don't know if it's a ritual, but the talent show mm -hmm. and the fire mostly that, uh, that we would do that and dance and drum and play till three in the morning was was extraordinary. So how would you say that the conference was different than what you expected? <laughs> or in what ways was it different? Yeah. <clears throat> what did you expect? Do you I don't know. I, I don't know what I expected. Um, I didn't expect to be so completely given over to it or uh, vulnerable in it, maybe. Um, I, I mean, I basically left that conference and, and started going to the council meetings, pretty much that next meeting. Um, is that the, is that, am I online? Yeah. Um, golly, I got up the um, nerve to leave Craig uh, to move out. Mm -hmm. That I actually sort of found it, uh, the, the power to do that, I think, in the conference. And I had this support system, this brand new support system that I didn't have before. Because mm -hmm. there were, you know, I, had fr I got made friends that weekend at that conference. So I'm taking it you you do, it is the case that some of your fears or all of them were kind of unfounded or misguided or something as far as what hap actually happened actually versus happened. what you thought was going to happen. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I don't even know if I understood what was going to happen mm -hmm. really in any, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so I about how often do you attend these conferences since then? <clears throat> I've attended all of the fall conferences but one. Okay. Um, is there anything interesting about why you didn't go to that one or was it was just a circumstantial thing? Um, it was just circumstances. Okay. R really. Um, so, what are some of your favorite conference memories, regardless of when, which conference they happened at? Just pick some of your faves and think about it if you need to. Some of your things yeah. you're glad that happened. <clears throat> well, certainly th that first fire changed me. Um, I became a, a, a start going to a drum class indicator and played uh, djembe for 20 years because of that conference um, and that night there's so many um, Kali the King ritual where we march down to the memorial garden um, a spring conference where we a whole bunch of sat on the deck drug our mattresses out on the deck and just spent the afternoon in the sun painting our fingernails and and just hanging out. Um, gosh, the the uh, trance, the trance dance uh, for the visioning, which was is an aside kind of gathering. But we had a little mini trance dance at the mountain, and the gay men's chorus was there for their winter retreat. And I, it's a long story, but it, it was just an, the contrast of us up against them and our trans dance up against, you know, the, this sort of what I used to think gay was, where you, you had Kohlhein loafers and you, and you drank a lot and like that. We, we were so different and so much more um, authentic. Uh, that was an amazing evening. I, guess, I don't know if I explained that very well, but... The day I sat on the deck with Raven 
and there were some others, and um, these three ravens, or blackbirds, flew across the sky like a minute apart, and we sat there and talked about that, and that was probably the only time I actually got to spend with Raven one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's a great memory I have. If any others pop up, just be sure that. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are some of your favorite conference activities? And has that changed over the years as you've gone to more conferences? What you particularly look forward to? Unless you don't have any favorite ones, which is fine too. Oh yeah, I do. Um, I do. Um, well, the fire for sure. Um, probably anything that where we're all together as opposed to split up doing a bunch of different things would, would be what I look forward to the most. Mm -hmm. Like not being so frantic, hanging more in the world of hanging out together or mm -hmm. like that. Like the dance and the talent show, we're all together. Um, who was one of your most memorable keynote speakers uh, from any of the conferences, and why are you picking that person? I love Tom Spanbauer, uh, and I'm not sure how much valid that is just because uh, it was my, I was so raw and vulnerable, open, and, and he had, he just had this charisma. And of course, there was a book, the, the book that he wrote was perfect for the cop, because it was a book like I'd never read anything like that before. Um, Malcolm Boyd was dear and amazing and had this, this kind of, um, mainstream quality and and then at the same time in his spirituality he embraced a, a kind of um, bad boy I mean we did we did a spanking workshop that weekend and it was just this combination of, of who he was that that was very unique to me um, Toby Johnson one thing that struck me right in the beginning of GSV for me was that there were men that came there like Malcolm and Toby and, and Tom and, and everybody who did things in their lives, produced things in their lives that I would never do or be or have any way to get to them. I just had no way to, to get to somebody like Toby Johnson who produced this magazine and or you know it was a writer and an author and and that whole world I, I, I just, um, so the access to to men like that is amazing to me mm -hmm. okay. tell us about somebody at a conference who was particularly another conference goer that particularly who was particularly memorable for you Somebody you met at a conference. Any conference. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to think about that one. Okay. We'll come back and ask it again. Yeah. With somebody that you met and <coughs> didn't expect, had not known before, but that turned out to be a significant person in your life. Well, actually, um, um, Bear Bergman. Uh -huh. Okay. Just was uh, I was on the council for him, and part of the we'd had Peter Peter Toscano too. Really, um, we had him the year before, and it was took something because because there, so there was this whole trans conversation in the council. Should we? Shouldn't we? 
just there was angst around having Peter Toscano there because he what he was controversial, I guess. And then the ne and then we realized that we had sort of um, pulled our finger out of the dike, and and we there was some shit came up around Peterson, and you know we touched a nerve, and we needed to go this more, and so then we found a uh, bear, and um, he cracked it wide open. It, it was an amazing conference because of him, mm -hmm. what he brought, uh, what he made us look at and question, and um, our homophobia was just in our face. Because was the controversy about the Native American stuff, or what, what, or about him not being a gay man, or what? Was it was that uh, Bear was uh, a trans man. A so, trans person. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, that's an important piece of the information. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He and and he 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 identified as he lived as he looked like he, but was actually a woman. Mm -hmm. Um. And lived as a, lived as a gay man. I mean, had a, a partner. That they were a gay couple, mm -hmm. um, and it really freaked some of the some of the other guys out. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, mm -hmm. because they were attracted to him. There, were, there was an overheard conversation on the deck, um, and it got back to bear that these guys thought he was hot. And then, and then somebody else said, oh, well, you know, and they were, you know, and it got back to, to Bear and, and it caused uh, the conference to get even bigger because it pissed Bear off. And it, and it, he had to kind of recreate who he was going to be at this, at our conference because, because he couldn't be what he had been at you know, Washington State University when he lectured there, or he had to really uh, bring himself to it, I guess, the way to say it. Mm. And he called us out. He called, he, he said, this is, you know, he let us have it, and we needed to have it, to hear it. It was amazing what happened that year. Mm. We saw our homophobia. <clears throat> What is your opinions, or what are some of your opinions, about the conference planning process? <laughs> it's or, a process. <laughs> or, or, or you can explain why you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Either way. Um, I'm laughing because it takes something, and we had it figured out for 20 years. And sort of in, in that we planned great conferences and we got along and we um, loved the work, I think most of us. But then we burn out. There it was uh, one, part, one piece of it that didn't work was we never could get replacement uh, leadership people. We couldn't get people, new people to come to the council. So it was the same people doing it for 20 years, more or less, and, and we, it, we just burn out. So um, we're, we're, the council now is still really trying to figure out how to do it uh, in the new way in the last five years. Yeah, four years, is, it's been restructured and it's it's a it's an organic process. Maybe it's evolving. Okay. Did you ever feel uncomfortable at part of the conference? And if so, why were you why were you uncomfortable? And you know what was it like? Whatever that was. It doesn't have to be a first conference where you would naturally be uncomfortable. But right. Um, some other yeah. incident or <clears throat> process or situation. What? What? Yeah. Was did that happen for you ever? Oh yeah. 
Well, I mean, I was uncomfortable, like you said, at the first conference. And um, at some point, I guess, I learned that if I'm uncomfortable, that's probably a good thing. I'm going to get, something's going to happen. Um, and so, uh, probably the, the biggest, the next time was when Martin Treewalker started to um, talk to me about being presiding elder. And I was n not having it. It was too much and too big and I wasn't, wouldn't be good at just, uh, you know, saying stuff, making stuff up. I, w I don't do well in front of large groups. and um, So I was confronted by that and at the same time flattered and um, and, it, and also going, okay, now here's one of those places where you're uncomfortable and you could become something bigger, make a difference like that. Mm -hmm. And I took it on. And um, the first few times getting up and speaking to the, co to the conference, to everybody, uh, was very, very scary. I was just, it was hard. And then I realized that it was kind of fun. And I was maybe okay at it. And and that they liked me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what have you taken from GSV and incorporated into your life? You mentioned earlier that the drum thing became a like a long-term thing. That was something that came out of that conference. Yes. It, are, were there other practices or My gosh. things that you've... Uh, well, where I live. Talk a little bit about that. How I, that I mean, it, it's in a very short period of time, probably pretty much my whole support system had somehow come out of GSV, like the next five years maybe. Or, mm -hmm. And um, Paul Plate, who owned this property, we met at a conference and became friends, and he got involved, and we, we just uh, had, were friends, and he had this piece of property that he was renting and it, and it wasn't working very well for him and I suggested that I buy it and he said yes and and I would wouldn't be here I don't think mm -hmm. if I hadn't been to GSV. Okay. And here just tell tell people who don't know where here is what here is. Uh, um, it's a, we it's a small community. Uh, there's three houses. Paul and Lashes live in one, John and Mary live in a tiny tumbleweed house, and I live in the third house on five acres in Decatur. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay. There's a lot of stuff in my life. Uh, I don't know that I would have my job, actually, um, if it wasn't for two people, two friends from GSV. And, and all the work I've done with Landmark came from, from Phil Robst, who mm -hmm. was, uh, who's a friend and insisted that I go to dinner with him three times before I said yes. Mm -hmm. And Landmark is? Landmark Worldwide is a, is a um, metaphysical, it's a study of, of human being. Mm -hmm. And they, Landmark does programs um, the first one's called the Forum, and it you put your past behind you. It sounds really corny, and but it, it actually works, mm -hmm. and you do put your past behind you. Mm -hmm. And what's available then, like I put my father strangling on the floor, I got to put that behind me, mm -hmm. and the, and the freedom uh, to create something. With, with all that crap that we carry around with us, um, th there's freedom in that. Okay. How does GSV seem different from other gay organizations you've been involved with? You might 
mention what other gay organizations you've been involved with. Landmark is not a totally gay thing, is it? No. Okay. No, Landmark's uh, very diverse worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's. Have you been involved in other gay organizations? That's a good Before question. Before or after uh, GSV? Mm, not really so much. I was in uh, Olympics out of Cobb. Mm -hmm. which was a, a um, activist militant thing where, where we got together and we actually kept the 96 Olympics from being in Cobb County mm -hmm. because of who they were being. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So how, that, did, how does your experience with those two organizations, how, are they, how do they feel different or uh, how uh, are they different, say? Yeah, they're very different. The uh, Olympics out of Cobb wasn't about spirituality really at all. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think about that. What are the are the, are the way they they make their decisions real different too? It was consensus. Was it? Okay. Yeah, I thought about that. How have the conferences changed since you first went to one? How how are they? How do they feel different? now than they did then. Oh, now they're way more beat to death. I mean, in the, those first years, they were simple. The rituals were, were much simple. And a lot of what's missing, I say, was stuff that happened in the moment. Like your, the small groups happened in the moment. You, everybody got there. They had designated small group leaders, but but that was all sorted out, kind of, it it all was together. That I miss. That it, it had a really really organic. Um, now it's very organized, and very scheduled, and very um, sort of anal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other observations about how it's different now, or how it feels different from the beginning? Besides the planning process? Well, I think the planning, the leadership in the planning process impacts what it, it causes the conference. And so if, if there isn't that kind of organic let, let spirit do it, as opposed to having all this control and and we gotta, you know, we gotta just work it, work it. You know, it does impact the quality, I think, of the conference. Okay. Tell us about your memories of a Gay Spirit Visions brother who is no longer alive. Just, there are several of them to pick. Uh, yeah. Wow, okay. Um, well, there's. Martin Eskenidis, Tree Walker, King Thaxton, um, John Stowe, all, they were all, well, there's a, a few. King Thaxton was amazing. He was there for me from the beginning. He was a very um, extremely creative man. Hard to get to know. We became friends after considerable work. Um, <laughs> And he had he brought a, a point of view to the council, where it was like okay to be pissed off, and it was okay to GSV kind of would dance around hurting people's feelings and and you know saying the right stuff and nobody get upset. King's like no, you know he was very very clear in his. Um, in his anger sometimes that he just it was there. It was great. I mean I could go on about Martin and John Stowe and um, Ray, um, Ramon Noya was a big influence. How do you hope that GSV could support your spiritual journey in the future? How do you see GSV's role in your spiritual journey from now on, if you see anything in particular. 
do you see how they would be there? That's a rough question because it um, the 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 twenty fifth this last conference um, was very confronting for me. It was it was I left angry and upset, and I've never left a conference in that place before. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to see, it's hard for me to see how, how, how that's going to go in the future. Okay. Well, what advice would you give to somebody who's about to, to attend his first conference? What would you tell that person to make it easier on them? Uh, to definitely go mm -hmm. without expectation or without to sort of to go uh, and come from nothing or, or to go uh, and just be open and, and right herd on making up what it's going to be or what it's not going to be and just let it happen mm -hmm. for you. Okay. Is there anybody in particular you would recommend that we also interview for the Gay Spirit Visions Oral History Project? Who, who do you think we should definitely talk with? Um, Andrew Raymer. Okay. Oh, I'll wow, think about that. Um, Franklin. Gary Kaufman. I'm just tr thinking of the men who... who uh, Either were there in the beginning or short, you know, have been there for a while. Maybe not. It doesn't always have to be. Yeah. Um, wow. Hmm. Peter, Peter Kendrick, mm -hmm. Ron Lamb, of course. Um, David Salyer, Kim Pittman, Jim Jones, Phil Ropes. <laughs> um, Cal Goff. Okay. <coughs> uh, Randy Taylor. Kyle Yak, just keep, yeah, keep going here, I guess. Um, this may be impossible to answer, but we'll ask it anyway. What, what do you value most about Gay Spirit Visions? Like one word. <laughs> no, not one word. Uh, yeah. Um, oh gosh. Love the love that it has provided, or the uh, love and creation, the creativity, probably maybe the creativity of it. Uh, at least I, it, GSB used to <laughs> be really good at creating from nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, t or or just having this sort of base of we do this conference and it's and these people come and what's it going to be? And, and so I think that's really cool to create something from nothing each year mm. with some structure, of course. But okay. okay, we wanted to talk to you today about your history with GSV and how it its importance in your life and. We've asked all these questions, but what have we not gotten around to, or what else do you want to say about GSB that we haven't gotten around to touching on? That maybe you wish we had asked, or you want to add <coughs> because we didn't ask the questions the way you thought they would be asked, or whatever. <coughs> we don't want to li leave out a whole chunk of something that's important about GSV2 to <coughs> you before. Mm. Or ask the question so specifically that you haven't said what you want to say about GSV. <coughs> and if there's not anything else, that's fine. But <coughs> that's the last question. That is the last one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um. And you can think about it if you want. Like if we were to walk out the door in five seconds and what would you say? Wait. Yeah, right. <laughs> we didn't get to this part. 
You didn't even think about this part or ask about that. I know that um, there's been conversations about how relevant GSV is, and what, like, and why did it, why did GSV happen in the South, as opposed to where you might think it should happen, like Russian River, California, or mm -hmm. someplace mm -hmm. sort of um, that you would expect. I think. Uh, that it is still relevant and I think what happens there is, is it's the most unique thing that I've ever found the most unique the most um, alive or fulfilling gay experience in a group what am I trying to say uh, community kind of setting like that that I what happens is magic I think and it, it can be life changing and I think I want it to continue I think it's relevant for the world today maybe more so than it was 25 years ago my concern is that we don't lead from spirit. The spirit part of the leadership is somehow forgotten or paved over with control and, and um, yeah, like domination, like ego, like I want it this way, like I, I want it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I've seen that uh, concerns me in the last couple of years it seems to have got lost. Well, this is not on our list, but I'm, I'm curious to, to hear what you have to say about um, how Shauna and you, d how his going to the conference and whatever he whatever his experience was that he told you of that, how that fits into your story too. I mean, how did that, to just talk a little bit about when he went to his first conference and how it was being there with him versus without him there, I mean, how did that change it for you? And what do you have to say about, what would he, some of the things he might be saying about the conference if he were here? But particularly how it affected your experience of the conference, did it? Okay. Including if there are contradictory feelings, like it was better, but it was kind of weird, different, and worse too. Uh-huh, right. All of that. Well, being at the conference with Sean was, was I don't know if it was better, it was, um, I never had been to a conference with a boyfriend or, mm -hmm. or a partner or lover or anything. So being there with him, sharing that with him was a whole new sort of world. Um, Do you remember hesitating to ask him to come or did, did you know right away you wanted to ask him to come to the next one after y'all met? Oh, I, no, I knew him immediately that he, he, he was, he was going to go if I had to throw him in the trunk, okay? <laughs> because I knew, well, I didn't, I don't know if I knew, but I pretty much knew that he, whatever he was going to make up about it or whatever, he was going to love it because I knew what, that how accepting, I mean, I've seen guys get up at the talent show and be just awful. Yeah. And everybody loves them and claps and it's like great and oh my god you were one you know so I just knew that there was a lot of possibility in the conference for Sean uh -huh. and there was and Did he have any hesitations about going? Do you remember? Oh yes. He did. Oh yeah. Were they the same ones that you had had or were they different ones? Well, his he was um, he was still trying to figure out Shauna uh -huh. And how to do that in the world, and and uh, so here's this. 
I, I don't think it ever occurred even to Sean that he could be Sean in a group kind of environment, a gay group kind of. I mean, I mean, I don't know that he ever saw that as even a possibility. Mm -hmm. So he was confronted by, you know, he wanted to express Shauna, and what was that going to be like there with all these strange men? And, you know, he had some of the same stuff about how gay men are judgmental and shallow and, you know, um, can be cruel and, and catty and Mm -hmm. And uh, and I would say, it's not like not like that and uh, so he had fears about it for sure okay. and they were uh, very unfounded. Uh -huh. and what he, do you think his first conference was as liberating for him as it what had been for you in a way or do you remember any reactions he had to the first conference? Oh yeah yeah. Were they pretty positive? He, or? Yes, he loved it. He, he was, um, Sean wasn't somebody that would ha have, like, get really emotional like I can be. So, so I could read him in that, in his, um, just that he was, ha it was so cool to see him have fun mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of, um, live into that expression of Sean in the conference and start start wearing the clothes he brought. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he was in the Walk of Beauties. That was a big deal for him. To do that in front of 130 gay men. Must have been interesting for you. Too. It, it was it was um, Beautiful for me because because I loved him and to see him uh, be able to to come out and, and express who he was finally in his life in, the, in this big way at the conference with, that's so joyful and, and fun and you know just uh, party kind of there was no heaviness to it or judgment or anything I think that was very Sean loved it, mm -hmm. and I loved watching him love it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember y'all's coming back home from the conference? What some of the things you talked about, or how it felt? Was it like, or do, or do you remember that at all? I do. I remember actually driving down the road, <laughs> and uh, David Salyer and Kim Pittman, and. Um, Phil Ropes come up beside us and Phil Ropes mooned us from their car. <laughs> I do remember that. Um, I don't, I just remember warm and fuzzy and, and just, you know, there's always sort of a recounting of the conference when you drive home, it seems like, mm -hmm. talking about everything that happened, who they met. and. Um, I can't, I don't remember anything specific about it. Mm -hmm. Aside from being excited for what was next, he was excited about what was, what the next one and mm -hmm. what are we going to do. And How many conferences did, did he go to? Do you know? Four. Four? Uh -huh. I think. Okay. Yeah. And were there any, uh, differences that you'd like to mention between the way Shauna kind of incorporated GSV into his life, if at all, compared to the way you did? Like he didn't go onto the council right? for not. whatever reasons. Uh -huh. And so if... Well, if the council changed uh -huh. right, sort of right there, where we, right after we met, uh -huh. and became something else. And I was, um, I, I sat on the old council for a couple of years while we were, when we first got together. But then I let, and I stepped away, so I think that was also part of maybe what, that he didn't take mm -hmm. on something. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, I think it gave him a confidence. And I think he saw that people liked him as Shauna. Mm -hmm. that he could figure, he could do that in a way that was, 
he did it in a way that was authentic. Mm -hmm. It was him. And, uh, and he played with that. I think he, he um, tried different things in the, at GSV to see how it worked in the world of Shauna. Mm -hmm. And then One Walk of Beauty, he um, went as him as a big rig mechanic in his greasy old hat and his, had his tools and had his little gun and walked the walked to the stage. Nobody mm -hmm. knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> but it was but it was he created that. Uh -huh. That wasn't me or you know, it was something it it gave him a, a he gave himself permission to create a, uh -huh. and go for it, I think, in GSV. Yeah. Did you feel any particular friction or um, dissonance between like the the way you were treating GSV, your network there, and what he did, or that you were more into it than he was, or any anything interesting, maybe, or that you would want to comment about how that played out for two of you, because that's an unusual situation for GSV people to be in a couple. Mm -hmm. So I um, was just curious if, if that was a source of bonding or tension or both or neither. It was, there was nothing, um, there was no discord about it anywhere. Okay. We, um, we had our own, we had a set of sheets that were our conference sheets. <laughs> we got them because we figured out you could you could take those two awful little twin beds and turn them the other way. And we got sheets that fit, and you we could set up this whole bed and be in the same bed together. Uh -huh. And the sheets held the bed together, and so we were a couple, and it was cool. And everybody, uh, no, uh -huh. okay. not really. Uh -uh. Um, he was very he was loved very right off, I think, mm -hmm. by pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're done, unless you're not done. And then, you want yeah. to talk about the gift? Was it about the lay experience? Yes. Okay. Let's go back to that. You were mentioning earlier something about your first gifting. Yes. Yeah, so I, um, my first uncomfortable, big uncomfortable, was when I realized I didn't have a gift, right? So the whole conference was shot. It was just going to be wrecked. I was, ugh. and I brought the lay in from the car and laid it on the altar, and and then and then and then we gift the gifting piece was on Sunday at the end of the conference, and uh, you know for me of course I'd fallen in love with probably 90 of the 120 guys. And, you know, I couldn't talk about it, and I couldn't, like John Stowe, I couldn't even look him. I was so intimidated. He was so beautiful, and, and this kind of expression of life that I just was, oh, if I could just be him. <laughs> I, I was, anyway, um, so Franklin was uh, in our small group, and, and um, Michael Goatee's roommate, and it was two guys I remember, and Bat Boy, and um, and this man from from Chicago, and lo and behold, he had fallen in love with that lay, and coveted it the whole weekend, and ended up with it, and it was ran. I can't remember how we did the gift thing, but you, you, he he didn't pick it in the end. It was just. I remember going, oh my God, what just happened? Mm -hmm. he, that's what he wanted. Of all the stuff on that altar, that goofy lay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of my, maybe my first GSV miracle, mm -hmm. or, or woo woo, yeah. you will, right. kind of thing. The small group experiences are part of the foundation of what makes the conferences magic, or most people would agree with that. 
Do you remember a particularly intense small group experience that you'd like to talk about? Either the first <coughs> conference or not. Just something really powerful that happened in a small group. Yeah. And why you think, you know, do you agree that those are pretty important to making the conference? I do powerful? agree that they're, they're uh, I think, a fundamental piece of it because sometimes you, sometimes things come up for all of it and you, and you can actually process some of the, some of what's there for you at the conference in the small group. They can be quite, um, powerful, uh, experiences and just kind of a place to ground, um, and work through stuff. And actually last year, there was one guy that came in our small group and he was so angry. And we, uh, you know, a couple of us kind of worked on him and, you know, and, and he got to something and he spit it up and, and, and he got over it and, and it, the small group really did, I think, what it was meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember uh, another small group powerful experience that you were in? in? Yeah, I remember a couple. I remember one. There was a couple where I wanted to kill somebody. <laughs> because? Well, because he had, he this he came to the conference with his boyfriend, and his boyfriend flirted with somebody else at the dance. And so the whole, all our um, small group meetings after that was about him. And, and then, yeah. Um, but generally, that generally they're quite amazing experiences. Mm -hmm. I think they've been good. Great. Okay.